on the 26th of July, that's just under a month, the Booker Prize will announce the 2022 shortlist. So this is the video that you need to watch if you want to get a head start on your reading of the shortlist. We're going to predict what's on the shortlist. Now, the Booker Prize will announce a Booker Dozen. That means it can be 12 or 13 books, depending on the judge's discretion. I am going to predict a Gunpowder Fiction and Plot Dozen, which is 14 books, because I can't count. Also, I like the ability to just be able to get one wrong. To be eligible for the Booker Prize, it needs to be a continuous work. That is, it can't be short stories. It needs to be long form. That is, it can't be a novella. And it needs to be published in the UK or Ireland between the 1st of October 2021 and the last day of September 2022. That means that some of the books may not yet even be published. If you are publishing from overseas, you are allowed to have published outside of that time frame. If the book was published no later than the 1st of October 2019 and was still published in the UK and Ireland between those dates I mentioned before. This is only open to works of nonfiction. So basically, this is the award for novels. And it is only open to works that were originally published in English. If you are translated fiction, there is the Booker International Prize for you, which is for best translated work. With all of that preamble, let's have a look at what is going to make the shortlist. Now, the first thing I do when predicting the shortlist is to look at the Women's Prize for Fiction, because the Women's Prize and the Booker Prize usually share one. Now, this year's Women's Prize had 16 books long listed, but only three of them are eligible for this year's Booker Prize. And of those three, I don't think any are going to make it. So we're off the Women's Prize. But there are a few relatively safe bets. Probably the, the, the book that everybody is going to discuss with relation to the long list is Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. Now, Douglas Stewart won the Booker Prize in 2020 with his novel Shuggy Bane. If you've not read Shuggy Bane, it's an emotional story about an alcoholic mother and a gay child and how they deal with Glasgow in the 1980s. It's an incredibly powerful read. But Young Mungo is of really, really similar quality. And I think this is going to tell us a lot about the judge's preference in books as to whether it will make it or not. Because there is no doubt that Young Mungo is of sufficient quality to be long listed. But we have five judges. They're not the same five judges as they were in 2020. They're a completely different set of judges. So do they like Douglas Stewart as a writer, do they like his style or do they prefer something else? You say that Young Mungo is the first book that I'm going to put on the long list. I think if it's not on the long list, that tells us a lot about the sort of books that the Booker Prize judges are looking for. The next book that I'd like to talk about is Milk Teeth by Jessica Andrews. This book doesn't come out to the 21st of July, so I am really basing this on Jessica Andrews as a writer. This is her second book after The Incredible Saltwater was released two years ago. That won the Portico Prize, which is the best book released by a Northern English or Scottish author in the UK. And it is an absolutely superb bit of writing. Such efficient language that is able to do multiple things at once. I think Jessica Andrews is just a brilliant, brilliant author who is completely underrated and I hope that the book of judges get a chance to read her wonderful work. There's quite a few early reviews of Milk Teeth out there saying that it's even better than Saltwater and if it's even better than Saltwater it's very hard to ignore. This is a book about a young girl who was raised in the north of England who is raised with certain ideals. As she ages and meets people and gets into relationships and jobs and stuff she's forced to test those ideals in the real world. It takes place in the north of England, in London and in Barcelona. And it sounds so emotional and so good and just one of these, it's going to be a great character portrait and, and this story about who we are as children versus who we are as adults and how they sort of conflict and whether we'd be proud of ourselves and all the compromises we make along our way. I just think that this will be a wonderful book and if this is done half as well as Saltwater, it'll be a brilliant read regardless of whether it makes a long list. Love and Virtue by Diana Reed is an Australian novel and it's a novel that's gone under the radar, but out here in Australia, it's massive. Diana Reed has been compared to Sally Rooney, which is to say that 
she is a young author writing about young people who have relationships and therefore she must be compared to Sally Rooney. This novel is about campus life. It tackles the idea of consent and what we gain from sexual experiences. It looks at rape culture. And what I think is so wonderful about this book is that while Diana Reed is hitting you really hard with these themes, you don't realise that she's actually subtly putting little soft hints of other themes in there. I think it's a really wonderful piece of construction with this hard-hitting stuff about rape culture. But then we have these underlying things going on about trust and friendship. It's just such a wonderful, complete book. If this one has been nominated by the publishers, I find it hard to believe that it won't make the long list. I guarantee you that this book will be massive in six months' time. You'll all know of this book. Now, that was the second of three books that I've read and rated five stars after after Young Mungo, and the last book that I've read and rated five stars. So we're, we're going to go into uncharted territories in a minute. But the last one I've read is Glory by No Violet Bulawayo, a Zimbabwean author who is taking Animal Farm and giving it an African twist. That sells me on the book already. Like, doesn't that, like, don't you just want to read an African animal farm, but make it three times the length? That description sounds great, but instead of a retelling of Animal Farm, this is more of an Animal Farm inspired novel that tells the tale of a fictional African country and the corruption that goes on in there compares it to the West. But what I think really separates this book from others is having read this book, it's so, so funny. This book is laugh out loud hysterical in between being really quite emotional and quite sad and Boxer going to the glue farm. There is no Boxer going to the glue farm in this. It's just, it, it, I'm not spoiling anything, it doesn't happen. It's such a, a well done and interesting and wonderful novel and it really does deserve to be read. There are two pretty big authors that I've got on this list that I haven't mentioned yet that have books that haven't been released yet. And the first one is Atesha Moshbeg with her book Lavonia. Atesha Moshbeg is famous for My Year of Rest and Relaxation or for Eileen. If you've read either of those two books, you know that Moshbeg does this thing with unlikable characters and takes you to quite dark places. And there's a sort of similarity between those two books. She's taken a risk moving away from what is clearly a very successful and popular formula. She's gone into historical fiction. This is about an orphan shepherd boy who finds himself at the center of a battle between religion and state. Doesn't it have just such a compelling and horrible looking cover that really does get the attention. I think Atesha Moshbeg is just a wonderfully talented writer and this is clearly a risk and it's a risk which is the sort of thing that can win you Booker Prizes. Scheduled for release on the 6th of October is Maggie O'Farrell's new book, The Marriage Portrait. Maggie O'Farrell's last book, Hamnet, won the Woman's Prize for Fiction. This lady can write. And can I tell you, the language and the just the playfulness and the poetry in Hamnet is so amazing. What she is able to do writing back to Shakespeare in that novel is clearly somebody who is just at the top of their powers and so talented. I am so looking forward to reading her follow-up work. I've got to say that when we talk about potential winners of the Booker Prize, Maggie O'Farrell is somebody that we really need to be looking at because she's definitely got the skills to win. We don't know much about this book other than it is a political novel set in Renaissance Italy. And I tell you what, that just gives me vibes of the Medicis and the Borgias and Machiavelli. And I'm just... I, I'm so happy reading about those people. I love reading about Renaissance Italy and all the new art and all the backstabbing and the, the poisoning and the, oh, I'm, I just, oh, I want to read that. Sarah Moss is an incredibly talented author that gets great reviews that I'm, I gotta be honest with you, I've not read her, but Nell has. And she told me that if I didn't put the fell on this long list that I was just destined to be wrong. This is a story about a woman in the height of COVID that goes for a walk when she's not supposed to. She ends up falling down and breaking her ankle and it leads to some sort of manhunt 
for her. This is definitely a novel that people are looking at, and from what I can gather, Sarah Moss is so wonderful, and I definitely will be looking to pick up a Sarah Moss very soon. So that's seven books. Now, my next seven are a little bit more off the beaten path. Those seven, with the possible exception of Jessica Andrews, although that's really the fault of reviewers, are probably the seven books that a lot of people, if, if they didn't include it on their list, they at least looked at it and thought about including them. I think that this one's got a great title, Nonfiction by Julie Myerson. Now, that's the sort of book that you just can't Google. I mean, you can, but you have to write Julie Myerson in. This is a novel about three generations of women, a mother, her mother, and her daughter. The daughter is struggling with addiction. The mother is a, a novelist, and she's really struggling to come to terms with this, while she's also trying to come to terms with her relationship with her own mother. This seems like a pretty typical, emotionally driven family saga sort of book, but where I think this book really captivated me is towards the end of the description it mentioned how the novelist mother was not exactly a reliable narrator. Uh, so I think that this more than just been a, a story about drug addiction and family and relationships, that we also got this this idea of how is the truth reported, which I think is such a wonderfully relevant topic in the current times. At Certain Points We Touch by Lauren John Joseph. I want to draw your attention to that cover, and I want to ask you, before I talk about this book, what is the gender of the model on that cover? Our narrator is a trans writer living in Mexico City who, on the 29th of February at four in the morning is walking the streets to remind of the birthday of a man who is their first love. Ten years earlier, our narrator falls in love with a boy named Thomas James across a bar in San Francisco. Their love affair is violent, it's intoxicating, it's passionate, and it is filled with power plays. It drags across countless years and it takes in many victims. This book is an own voices trans novel and it just sounds emotionally charged about toxic relationships and it is the sort of book that I really just want to read regardless. The review says it's narrated with caustic wit and deep sorrow. I tell you what, I love a book that is funny and sad. It brings up vibes of sorrow and bliss. There's something really dark sounding about this that really just sucks me in and gets me to want to read it. The Immortal King Rayu by Vashini Vara. The reviews of this book say that it takes the line between speculative fiction and literary fiction and shatters it into a million pieces. And that's the sort of book that everybody's got to want to read, right? Because I love these sort of arbitrary lines between genres being challenged and destroyed. The plot itself sounds really awesome. A Dalit Indian boy in the 1950s is born and ends up becoming the head of a corporation that controls the world. He gifts his daughter his memories on his deathbed. And she sort of goes through her father's memories as we see his rise up from the lowest caste of Indian society to the ruler of the planet. And it tackles how corporations run things and it's very it sounds very quite nihilistic and dystopian and really uh, throwing shit at neoliberalism the author is a former wall street journalist dystopian literary challenging you know societal criticism anti-capitalist, anti-ruling class. You know, we've clearly got things in there about race and gender as well. I just think that this is going to be such an interesting read and I hope it makes a book long list. The Swimmers by Julie Otsuka. This is a book that takes place in a swimming pool where we have people swimming in the slow lane and the fast lane. And this crack appears in the bottom of the pool. And at the same time, one of the swimmers is suffering from dementia. And this swimming pool is sort of like her last refuge from her mental illness. And she remembers times in Japanese war camps. And this is told from the point of view of her daughter. This sounds stunningly sad and about the process of aging. And I don't really know what this swimming pool and this crack has to do with it. But 
I'm really curious to find out. I saw Smirty review this on her channel, Sant Reads, and she said it made her cry and it was just very emotional. And I to tell you, a book that can make you cry and make you feel emotions is always going to stand out in the judges' minds. And I think that's why it's going to make the long list. Brother A Lie by Zahn Khalid. Three adopted boys are raised above a mosque. One of Nigerian background, one of Korean background, and one of unknown Middle Eastern background. Their father is a religious man who seems a bit absent and these boys go on crusades around the city to learn things. When one of the boys starts to see another boy. He keeps the sight of this boy a secret, but what he doesn't know is his father is also revealing a secret. What is that secret? I don't know. The description doesn't tell me. But the boys are forced to move from Stanton Island to Saudi Arabia. They're shocked by how modern Saudi Arabia is compared to Staten Island. I, I kind of like this sort of twisting it on the head that we think of the US and the UK and Australia, New Zealand as these like uber modern Europe, as these uber modern places and places like the Middle East as sort of coming along second. And I love this idea of going, actually, are you sure? Because this is a debut book. It's a novel about families, about broken families, about capitalism, power, sexuality, and the possibility of reunion. I just, I want to read it. So I'm putting it on the long list. We measure the earth with our bodies. Tersering Yangzon Lama. Set in Tibet in 1959, that's when China invaded and we're following these children on a refugee camp on the border of Tibet and Nepal. You have in, in cities in the Himalayas these like Tibetan markets where the Tibetans cross over illegally from China into Nepal. They sell their goods to the Nepalese because the Nepalese currency is worth more than the Tibetan currency and then they travel back. Now if they get caught doing this they get shot but it's how they earn their living. I think that's a fascinating little thing. Anyway, this intergenerational family saga shows uh, the loss of parents due to this uh, invasion and how the children cope with it not just at the time but in their later lives. It's been compared to Pachinko all the reviews of it are so positive, and who doesn't want to learn more about Tibetan culture? The Colony by Audrey McGee. Set in 1979, during the height of the Troubles, a English painter travels to an island in Ireland. There is a French linguist there, and there's this real animosity between the two of them. The linguist is there to study the Irish language and how it is affected by people learning English while the Englishman is there to just paint. The French linguist is really angry of this presence of the Englishman. Meanwhile, the Englishman is angry at the presence of the Frenchman, which seems a little bit like, why? The Englishman is a painter and he discovers one of the young boys on the island can paint and maybe even better than him. And he has this sort of choice of whether to help this boy meet his potential, whether to take him back to London and to introduce him to society or whether to just like plagiarize his work and stuff. This is actually a novel that I have read. I think it's a real multi-layered book that is about so much. There are so many wonderful Irish novels out this year that it's really hard to pick one. A lot of Irish and Northern Irish novels do seem to be about the, the travels and the IRA and all of that sort of stuff. I've limited myself to one and this is the one and I think because it's so much about language and art and plagiarism and colonialism and there's so many different themes and there's so many different ways you can view this book. I think that this is a real big strong literary work. So that is my 14 books. What are you picking for the Booker Prize long list? Have you read these books? What do you think of these books? I've not read many of them. I've only read four of them. Uh, let me know in the comments. All right, bye.